Last week, we brought you an exclusive ground report from the southern Lebanon town of Anakura. This week, historic Lebanese-Israeli maritime border talks began in this very town. Hello, and welcome to a new episode of the West Asia Post with me, Radhi Francis, our weekly show where we bring you your weekly dose of stories coming out of the heart of West Asia. Two long-time West Asian foes sat down for talks this week. Our next report brings you a roundup of what went down in these talks. The Israeli-Lebanese talks were described by the lead Lebanese negotiator as the first step on a thousand-mile journey. The meeting was held outdoors under the blue canvas covers near a disputed border at the headquarters of the UN Peacekeeping Force UNIFIL. Breaking up after barely an hour, the talks were the first to be held over the disputed sea boundary in decades. The United States and United Nations, which hosted the meeting, described it as productive. While Israel's energy minister, Yuval Steinitz, said that the delegation would push ahead with the talks to give the process a chance. Both sides have now agreed to meet in two weeks. Lebanese sources had originally said that the next talks would be held on October 28. But a statement from the President Michel Aoun's office said that they would take place two days earlier, on October 26. While Lebanon and Israel have had contested borders over the years, the issue of the maritime border is particularly sensitive, especially due to the possible presence of hydrocarbons in the Mediterranean. Currently, Israel and Lebanon have no diplomatic relations and are formally in a state of war. They each claim about 860 square kilometers of the Mediterranean Sea as a part of their own exclusive economic zones. In 2018, Lebanon signed its first contract for offshore drilling in two blocks in the Mediterranean for oil and gas. While the initial drilling in block 4 had shown traces of gas, exploration of block 9 has not started and is controversial because of disputed ownership. Both sides have commercial interests at stake. While Israel already pumps gas from huge offshore fields, Lebanon is yet to find commercial gas reserves in its own waters. Resolving this dispute would be a significant political achievement, one that could mitigate risk for energy companies looking to drill in the region. The Lebanese Speaker of the House, Nabih Birri, was the person who initiated these talks anyways. His advisor, who's been in charge for this file for the past 10 years, is Mr. Ali Hamdan. We listened together to an exclusive interview with Mr. Hamdan. It is the 10 years. It's accumulation. We started somewhere else and we ended up here. But we've never lost the direction and the target that we want, which is to put an end for the Israeli allegation in our EE zone. And that has started from 2010. And uh, we have gone after the United Nations and we asked at the same time for the US, United States, to play the role of mediator and facilitator in this regard, and they have agreed. So all this together, it took the 10 years, because sometimes, you know, it is a tough negotiation, and sometimes negotiation will stop for some time, and then a new envoyee will come to refresh the fight. First of all, um, the, the framework that we have achieved 
based on what we called April understanding, which happened in 1996, after the Israeli massacre in Kana. And later on, we have, the, you know, what controlled the uh, situation between Lebanon and um, Israel is uh, either the Treaty of 1949 or Resolution 425 and Resolution 1701 in 2006, plus the so-called April understanding. All this together, never in any meetings, 1996 till now, there is a committee and their meetings with UNIFIL called tripartite meeting. This is always the Lebanese army with the Israeli army. This is definitely UN and under the control of the UN, United Nations, UNIFIL in the South, in their office under their flag of the United Nations. So this is the same method, the framework based on the same method that had, has achieved, in fact, always some development. That's why there was a clear statement made by us, by Hezbollah, by other politicians in Lebanon, that, and this is something is uh, very sane, that Lebanon looked to this operation as a technical operation to make the demarcation, the delineation, offshore Lebanon, and at the same time, to clear all the disputed points on the international land border. The real change with the result, what we aim to see at the end, is to, as I mentioned earlier, to clear the Israeli allegation. And we see the Lebanese sovereignty on totally on the land and offshore. This is number one. Then it comes, Lebanon is planning to explore, and we have already started, and the first tender has gone on. And Total, by the way, is about to start exploration in the zone where the talks now is uh, taking place, just opposite Nakura, uh, in block number nine which is to explore, to explore for hydrocarbon. This is, this is one of the reasons that will maintain the stability and will encourage more all the companies to come and invest. The second set of the Lebanese-Israeli talks are expected to take place on October 26, and we will continue to bring you live updates about the heart of that conflict. But until then, and as always, let's take a look at the headlines we are tracking across West Asia. According to a watchdog group, Israel has approved over 12,000 West Bank homes in 2020, a record high for illegal settlements being built in occupied Palestinian territory. It comes months after Israel promised to put on hold plans to annex parts of the West Bank as part of the UAE peace deal. Yemen's warring sides begin a historic prisoner swap with planes carrying prisoners taking off from three airports. The two sides will exchange over 1,000 prisoners in the largest swap of its kind in the five-year-old conflict. Human Rights Watch report accuses the Syria-Russia alliance of committing possible war crimes and by deliberately attacking civilians' infrastructure in Idlib. The watchdog says Bashar al-Assad and Vladimir Putin are responsible and should be prosecuted. India contributes $1 million to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency to support Palestinian refugees who have been facing extreme challenges due to the pandemic. The move has been hailed by the UN body as timely help. This week, the MSC Paris became one of the first cargo ships to make the journey between the United Arab Emirates and the Israelis. This is a definite sign of normalizing relationships between the two. With the Abraham Accords, are the winds of change finally blowing in West Asia? We take a look.
from the port of Haifa. This may look like just any other cargo ship, but the arrival of this cargo from Dubai marks a historic moment in West Asia. What we have seen here, firefighting equipment that has been produced in Dubai and it's coming here to Israel to fight the fires in Israel. What can be more exciting than that? Uh, we have also uh, a, a chemical liquids that, have been, that are in the second container and we have other stuff. And uh, what can I say? This is just the beginning of a, of a whole new uh, uh, friendship. Just a few months ago, such a journey from Dubai's Jebel Ali port to the northern Israeli port city of Haifa would have been unthinkable. But winds of change are now blowing in West Asia. Israel and the UAE signed a normalization deal in August this year. One that has had rippling effects in the entire region. In a few moments, these visionary leaders will sign the first two peace deals between... But the Abraham Accords, brokered by the U.S., was not just a dawn of new peace in West Asia. It was also grounded in economics and potential trade collaborations. The deal laid the ground for a potentially profitable new trade route and bilateral trade between the two countries that could reach as much as $4 billion a year. Since the signing of the UAE-Israel peace deal, large corporations from both countries have established joint ventures. The UAE's Dubai Ports World, one of the world's largest port operators, has signed an agreement with Israel's Dover Tower to buy a stake in the privatization of Haifa Port, one of Israel's two main ports. Another industry to benefit from this is the diamond industry. Both of them are world leaders in diamond sales. And mutual collaboration could be a win-win situation for both Israel and the UAE. But it is not just trade that the Emiratis are eyeing. The promise of F-35 fighter jets could be a major reason why the UAE agreed to the deal in the first place. These weapon systems have been long coveted by the UAE, and it looks like with the Abraham Accords, they may finally be able to get them. But this could be a double-edged sword for Israel. A sale of F-35s to the UAE could erode Israel's military edge in the region one that may even put this peace deal in jeopardy. Whether the Abraham Accords will be able to stand the test of time is something we will have to watch out for. West Asia Bureau, we on World is One. In a recent interview, the Saudi prince Bandar bin Sultan accused the Palestinian leaders of failing its people. The scathing remarks mark the first for Saudi Arabia and raise an important question. Is Saudi Arabia's support for the Palestinian cause slowly eroding? Will it be next in line for a peace with Israel? Liars, cheats and ungrateful. That was the assessment of one of Saudi Arabia's most senior royals Bandar bin Sultan on decades of Palestinian leadership. It is also curiously close to the language employed for decades by Israel's right-wing peace rejectionists. Former Saudi ambassador to the US, Prince Bandar bin Sultan Al Saud, chastises the Palestinian leadership for its conduct following Israel's peace and normalization agreements with the UAE and Bahrain. After decades of preaching that Israel was the enemy, the Saudis are now pushing new messages about the Jewish state. 
comments were made in an interview with the Al Arabia Network. What I heard from Palestinian leadership in recent days was truly painful to hear. This low level of discourse is not what we expect from officials who seek to gain global support for their cause. Their transgression against the Gulf state's leadership with this reprehensible discourse is entirely unacceptable. Palestinian leaders have described the Abraham Accords as a betrayal and a stab in the back. Prince Bandar spent a remarkable 22 years as Saudi ambassador to Washington and was so close to former US President George W. Bush that he was often nicknamed Bandar bin Bush. He spoke of the historic failures of the Palestinian leadership. According to him, Palestine has taken Saudi support for granted. The Palestinian cause is a just cause, but its advocates are failures. And the Israeli cause is unjust, but its advocates have proven to be successful. That sums up the events of the last 70 or 75 years. There is also something that successive Palestinian leadership historically share in common. They always bet on the losing side, and that comes at a price. It is obvious that such words would not have been aired on Saudi-owned television without the prior approval of both King Salman and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. By choosing Prince Bandar, a veteran diplomat and long-standing pillar of the Saudi royal establishment to deliver them, it is the clearest sign yet that the Saudi leadership may be preparing its population for an eventual deal with Israel. For so many years, especially in the more rural and isolated corners of the kingdom, Saudis have been accustomed to viewing not just Israel as the enemy, but also all Jewish people. But the arrival on the scene of the maverick crown prince Mohammed bin Salman has changed all that. With reports suggesting that the crown prince is eager to strike a deal, this would be a seismic shift for the entire region. This week, United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo urged Saudi Arabia to recognize Israel. Uh, raised how the Abraham Accords brokered by President Trump contribute greatly. In what would be a strategic boost for the Jewish state amid normalization with two other Gulf Arab kingdoms. So a Saudi-Israeli peace deal, while not necessarily imminent, is now a real possibility. West Asia Bureau, Vion, this one. Next month, Formula One returns to Turkey for the first time since 2011. And on the other hand, the preparations for the 2022 Football World Cup are underway in Qatar. And remember that time when the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman tried to buy Manchester United? Even though the global sporting events try to rise above politics, it seems that the mega sporting international competitions are slowly becoming the playthings of authoritarian regimes. We tell you more. The Formula One is set to return to Turkey next month. This means the intercity Istanbul Park will host a race for the first time since 2011. But a lot has changed in Turkey since the last race. We are talking about strongman Erdogan's rise to power. The return of the auto racing event comes at a time when Turkey is fast descending into authoritarianism. Similarly, the preparations for the 2022 Football World Cup are in full swing in Qatar. But what has made headlines are the death of migrant workers and systemic abuse. The treatment of workers hired to build the infrastructure has been a major issue of concern. Human rights groups allege that the system in place leaves migrant workers vulnerable to systemic abuse. 
According to reports, there have also been several deaths on construction sites. Many even state that workers may not change jobs or even leave the country without their sponsor's permission. And that's not all. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's recent attempt to bid for Newcastle United and his previous bids for historic Premier League club Manchester United now signal a bigger problem. The growing trend of mega sporting events becoming the playthings of authoritarian regimes. The reason these games appeal to autocrats is quite obvious. A show of logistical prowess and leadership and a way to expand their soft power. Last winners. That means several mega sporting events are increasingly becoming the pawn of governments that can bid and spend freely without having to answer to voters. This coupled with systemic human rights abuses and a crackdown on those opposing them paints a troubling picture in the world of sports. If the trend continues, mega sporting events that aspire to remain above politics now risk becoming political footballs for regimes that want to shine the spotlight away from their troubling records. West Asia Bureau, Vion, World is One. That's all we have for you on this episode of the West Asia Post. I will see you next week with a brand new lineup, bringing you more stories from the heart of the most volatile region in the world. Until then, stay home and stay safe. This is Radhi Francis, and you are watching Vion, World is One.